Welcome back for this weekend in Portland. We have one more hour of classes of the Dharma. <coughs> uh, I think Dharma and higher would be Atmagyan, or knowledge of the self. It all pertains to the great self. May we make an offering of the small self into the great self, as these Upanishads tell us. So we want to spend this hour on deepening the Sadanga Yoga limb of Pranayam, uh, because the Upanishad is doing that. It's kind of was kind of a marvel to me to find so much about breathing in one of these Upanishads, uh, in several really, but this one really goes deep into it. So I responded in depth with a new chart, which I will show you in just a minute, uh, because we want to finish this out. We've done it already and that it, it prepares for the next chart. We want to take one deep breath and go Om Bhur Bhuva Swaha Tat Savitur Varanyang Bhargo Devasya Dimohi Dioyona Prachodayat I remember when we were singing in recording studios and you sing and you say, well, you hear you're breathing too much. You had to sing one line without breathing, you know, like if you could s just sing one line and then the other three lines you had to <laughs> gasp for breath in between every one of them, but you had to learn how to sing all four lines with, in one breath. So, um, because the recording engineers didn't, oh, I can hear you breathing too much. Same with the flute or other things, but in spiritual life with the mantra and everything, uh, you have to think in terms of no separations or no starts and stops. So. Ideally, you're going to be taking that Gayatri mantra and, and doing it in your mind. Your mind doesn't have to breathe in the same way your lungs do. So, in the same way that you know your your breath should be elongated without breaks, your mind's thinking of the Gayatri should be just on the Gayatri. I mean, you, that's a long time. You know, 15 seconds to recite the Gayatri in your mind. So there is time for other thoughts to get in there. Or maybe you didn't start your mind all centered on the Gayatri and only became centered in the middle of the Gayatri, like, what am I doing kind of nonsense. So uh, this is how you, you, they want you to do that then three times, so in, your, in the morning. So this is how you're going to take both your breathing practice and your mantra and connect them in your mind, shiras, which is shining, ruchira, and that's where we came to both of these charts we just looked at. Nine said, having destroyed all overlays, one should then think of Ruchira, the shining. And Ruchira is also then cessation. So the mind shines, I was saying yesterday, only when it ceases to think. Then its real light comes through. The thinking is a kind of, what was that word again? Sankalpa. Yeah, it's a kind of sankalpa that you're engaging in all the time, all filling your day with sankalpas, and then your body follows suit. You know, so the body's really just an extension of sankalpa, basically. Everything's an extension of the mind. So you want to kind of think differently about that or change the atmosphere around it, and that would be prachahara dharana. I mean, that's how to explain in simple English, straightforward, how how you're ascending the Sadanga Yoga limbs of the tree. So the only thing left to do after we've explained the Gayatri word by word, and I hope you have it in your notes, or you can look back on this class and you know, repeat it until it sticks, because snow doesn't stick on a wet road, Sri Ramakrishna says, only on a dry road. So you want to dry out the mind of the water of worldliness so that everything you take in sticks. Wouldn't that be nice to have a a memory like Sri Ramakrishna, who was like Sutradhara. He, he, they could remember everything uh, that was ever sung and said to him, and just recall it like that. Shankara was that same way. And they can do this with past lifetimes, too, not just with what they heard in this lifetime, but they're recalling things that they'll never forget. So that's that's a real solid sound, Antakarna. You know, it's, it's a ripened intellect. It's a non-dual mind, or a mind that's been taken 
out of its non-dual penchant and turn non-dual. And it's thoughts that are buoyant and not like heavy, like rainwater, seeking the lowest place. And it's an ego, as we just said, that's been refined. That's the fourfold mind in India. I found that out in college, first year of college. That's what mind is, finally. Somebody told me where willpower is. Somebody told me where thought was. Somebody told me what the ego was. It was all gathered together in one package, antaha, karana. Antaha, inner, karana, cause. So it's perfectly named. The mind causes everything. And it's true of your bodies. You, know, you get all your bodies out of your mind. So there's this body out here, came from this body in here. That's why they call them the three bodies. And they align them with waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. You have three different bodies in your three states of consciousness. Leading to where? The fourth, which is beyond bodies. Yeah, Turiya. So the last thing to finish this up then would be this beautiful quote from her own Upanishad, at which we've studied, Saraswati Rahasya Upanishad. Who knows what Rahasya means? Secret. Secret. You said? Ah, great. Yeah, her, her, the, the secret teachings of Saraswati's own Upanishad. Beautiful image of her, by the way, that we favor of the many beautiful Saraswati images. This is a nice one. She says in there, without taints I am. Being, knowing, and loving I am. To these words conform. The Devi Saraswati. What's being, knowing, and loving? Anurag. What's being, knowing, and loving? Yeah. yeah, I was surprised that years ago I asked him that. He knew it right away. So it's just not words. Being is sat, and knowing is chit, and ananda is loving. Being, knowing, and loving is sat, chit, ananda. That's a name for Brahman. One of the best names for Brahman. So now that the Gayatri has been brought forward with its connections, the worlds are called... The, the, yeah. the names for the words Bhur, Bhuva, Swaha are called Vriyahitritis. So the Upanishad says here, uh, um, that is called pranayama when one repeats this Gayatri with a prolonged breath three times with its Vyahritis and the pranava, which is Om, the word, before it along with the siras joining after it. That's the shining mind, the ruchira. Now it goes on and says, I'll read the slokas and then we'll go to the chart. It takes uh, f five slokas here. Uh, this is why I say this Upanishad goes deep. Ruchira, parents, cessation, expiration and inspiration, these three are pranayam. They're called kumbhaka, rechaka, and puraka. So kumbhaka is your held breath, and then rechaka is your expelled breath, and puraka is your in breath. So this is going on all the time, you know, 400,000 times a day and 240,000 times a night, you do this. <laughs> this is natural breathing. Ajapa, it's called. It's, it's, you don't have to do japa. It, it's doing you. So your breath is going on like this all the time. But imagine if you connected the mantra to every breath, or you th the thought of Brahman to every breath. See? Well, that's kind of what you did three times here when you did the Gayatri uh, with Divine Mother there. Next sloka then, that's 11. Rechaka, expiration, is defined as raising up the vayu, breath, air, wind, subtle wind, it says here, from the akasha, space, ether, heart. That's the main akasha that you want to think of. They'll teach us that later, uh, that the real akasha is here. All space is in the heart, uh, heart-mind connection, you see. So you could say space, ether, out there, planets occupying it, you know, and Ether is the one thing that's most like Brahman in this world because it's 
it's uh, uh, all pervasive. No, it's not effulgent. It's got a few effulgent stars in it. But space basically is, is uh, permeating everything, isn't it? I mean, air can't do that, but space can. That's why the scientists went off on that one, you see. Started thinking deeper about physics and so forth, because space started to occur to them. But what didn't occur to them was four other kinds of space. <laughs> Not just physical space, which alone is subtle enough, but then the space of prana that's flowing somewhere. We'd call it inside of nadis, somewhere. Uh, and then the space of mind, where thoughts are flowing, that's another space. And then there's the space of uh, intelligence. It's got its own space too. And it can, it can go flowing without the mind. It can go beyond the mind. And then this, the, this, the space of consciousness, which is not space at all, Sri Ramakrishna says, but it has to be included in the five kinds of space. So, Bhutakasha, Pranakasha, Manakasha, Gyanakasha, and Chid, Chid Akasha, not Chit, because that would be thought, but Chid Akasha, consciousness. So four of those spaces are left out of our ideology. We don't know anything about them. We only think in terms of one space, physical. But if you were to look at the ether of that one space, it's very subtle. You can't displace it like air. You know, it infills everything. And when I think of it, I start hearing Om. I hear a humming. I always have, since I heard it in the cradle. So, and I remember hearing it in the cradle. It didn't last very long, but I remember it. So it's this idea about a space in which things are vibrating. So all these things are vibrating inside a physical space, right? Flesh kind of dense, and wood denser, and stone and marble densest of all. And they all have rates of vibration of you know, up to the atomic particle, if we get to the subatomic particle, we can't even measure it. And then beyond that, what is it? Well, that's prana. And the scientists will not, cannot make that bridge yet, because you'd have to connect consciousness and intelligence to do that. And you'd have to have a source that you're looking for. If your source is physical, then your result is going to be physical. But if your source is spiritual, then the physical is going to have to connect five times inward see, to, to reach that essence, Swarupa essence. So, Ray Chaka is defined as raising up the Vaya, Vayu, subtle wind, from the Akasha, region in the heart, it says here in Perens. Then making the body void of Vayu, no more air, while emptying and uniting the soul with a state of void. So you empty your mind. It's just like, you, you know, you're breathing in all of this and then drawing it from an akasha, holding it and emptying it. And uh, so that's pranayam. It's called puraka, inspiration or in-breath. When one takes in vayu as a man would take water into his mouth through a lotus stalk. Well, that was probably their straw back then. Hey, buddy, you got a straw for that milkshake? They hand you a lotus stock. <laughs> you know. So uh, a man could take water into his mouth through a lotus stock. That's how you want to take in your breath. So I was talking about fear, you know, and how to get rid of fear of death. So you know, and you do a, a kind of breath that impedes your oxygen and draws it in for a long time. You hold it and then you let it out. So this can become a very long, long breath. You could do it like two minutes, you know, by the time it's finished. And then where did death go? You know, it's just like uh, you, know, you, you do this and you kind of get, get the idea that man does not live by bread alone, but does not live by oxygen alone either. If Christ could have gone on to explain the teachings that he gave to the Essenes, then he would have started talking about how you'd, you'd, you'd live without breath, too. And uh, that's Kumbhaka. So they had done this and written it down, you know, thousands of years earlier. 
called kumbhaka when there's no expiration or inspiration, no out-breath or in-breath, and the body is motionless, remaining still in one state, and when that happens, he sees forms like the blind, hears sounds like the deaf, and sees the body like wood for fire. <laughs> so, just burn the body uh, you know, uh, in the fire of prana. It doesn't exist anymore. There's even a Buddhist breath, another beautiful one I used to teach you. Uh, it was called the burning pillar. So you, you'd sit there and, you, and uh, you'd uh, imagine, you'd envision, I guess be better, the six passions and how they're each connected with the six centers in your lotus stock and your hollow stock we were calling it yesterday. And you'd connect each of those passions, you'd wash it clean with one of the elements call the five five winds and as you do this you you know you're taking it up the spine and your body starts trembling and you start perspiring and those are the first signs of successful pranayama and then pretty soon you just the whole body is burning so it's like wood for fire and the result of that is is that you become a burning pillar so they call that the shine, the, the burning pillow, pillar, pillar meditation. It is burning the pillow of the body too. But you, you draw it in and you just shine. So you're shining for everyone, like Jesus shone, like Buddha shone. You see, the, the, they have a ojas coming off their pores, and a light coming off them. The Holy Mother said she used to rub Sri Ramakrishna's body in the early days with oil, and she just see this light coming out of his pores. So uh, that's technically known as ojas, or what you get when you take food, say the mantra over it, practice breathing exercises and sadhana and meditation with it, and it begins to turn into light. It's like intelligence making its appearance. So those are the six slokas on pranayam, and I, it inspired me enough to, I think, make a six chart, because uh, I think I have five good pranayam charts, and I could have pulled one or two out and shown them to you again, as we've done over the last 25 years, or the years that the charts have been in existence. But I just went ahead and extended myself, and with, with the idea of this being Vedic pranayam, and tantric pranayam, and yogic pranayam, not hatha pranayam like we're talking about. It's just pretty much your lungs, you know, turning your lungs into a pair of bellows kind of thing. And, you know, twisting your body into different shapes, as I like to say. So, and with no mantra connected to it and no dharmic connections to it. So you're just breathing, basically. And I found then in the Upanishad, very gratifying, say, you know, 100 times more powerful is doing a breathing exercise this way. And so I titled the chart, The Significance of Pranayama in Vedanta and Ashtanga Yoga. How you should be thinking of this practice as much, much more noble than it's being presented to us in what we call yoga in the West today, popular. So, and, and then that's the subtitle. So the real title is The Breath of Eternal Life. This is how you, you live in a breathless state. So you have to learn, it's funny, we don't breathe, right? I mean, in Hawaii, we came over to Hawaiians, Captain Cook and all those people, came in there, sailed into the islands. They saw we were white, and they said, oh, you're Haole. <laughs> you ever heard that word? So you go to Hawaii, and you mix with the locals, and say, oh, you're just a Haole. So it means white. It means you don't breathe. So they thought we were holding our breath and turning white because we were white-skinned. And so to this day now, it's kind of a slur on the Caucasian person to go over there and be called, oh, you're just a howly, you see, because they think you're not breathing. So anyway, it's funny that, in a, in a sense, they're right, you know. Captain Cook sailed in, you know, buckled up and everything, and then the Puritans came over and made the Hawaiians get dressed, and, you know, they were all, like, clamped up in their clothes in the hot weather, pent up, you know, foisting a, a version of Christianity which wasn't Jesus' intention on them and so forth and so on, don't get me started. So here you have uh, 
the fact that we have to learn to breathe again is what I'm trying to get at. We have to learn to breathe again, just naturally. Uh, and it would be better than if we followed it up with awareness of our breath. And so this is awareness of the breath, what it signifies, what it means to breathe. Not just let's breathe like Kata Yoga. That's just a, a very short step. So how to, how to begin, basically the image there, as you see, is the wind god, nice image there. And you see all these triputis connected to it. Down here, projection, sustenance, withdrawal. So that's, in the mind, that would be creation, preservation, and destruction, right? Or we like to say projection, sustenance, and withdrawal. Because creation is a questionable word in philosophy. You, nothing gets created because it was never destroyed. It just changed forms. It went from form to formless. It went from manifested nature to unmanifested nature in our mind. You can't destroy anything. It just goes to its seed form. And then, can you destroy its seed? No, you can go beyond its seed because nobody can stop the cycles of creation except her. So creation is not a good word we'd want to use. Projection, now you're getting there. It's a vibration from a mind, and then it's just withdrawn again. So sustenance, projection, sustenance, and withdrawal is happening. And that's like your breath, isn't it? So connect that. The breath is, you know, a later expression of that. God had to breathe too through his mind. So this was his breath. And later on, you turned it physical. You see? And then you forgot about it, and you forgot to connect it. So that's what connections called triputis, triple teachings, are about. They're much better than dualities like pleasure, pain, and uh, joy and sorrow. Those, those trip us up. They trip us up, cause emotional problems. Next one is past, present, future. So time is also like a breath. Um, when, it's, when, it's in a, in a, when it's underway, you know, it, it's the present. It's not the eternal moment yet. It's just like the breathing isn't the eternal breath yet. <laughs> You're going to have to render that one. But it is underway, you know, so that's called present. But then you look from the present, you say, oh, wait, I came from somewhere past, you see. And you start identifying with the past, which is a big problem for a lot of people. Thinking of my ancestors who died or, you know, whatever the case. Uh, you know, I lost my dog last month or something. So everything that happened in the past is crowding in, you see. And then you, then you look to the future, which is a kind of projection, isn't it? Sankalpa, as they're telling us here, Sankalpa. So you would want to be not just trikala, but you'd want to be trikala darshi. Shiva is called trikala darshi. So if you if you know Shiva and you go to him, he's aware of the three phases of time, and he could only be aware of them simultaneously if he was in a timeless place called the eternal moment. And, and so your breath follows that. When you when you attain kumbhaka, you're in a breathless state. And deep sleep is teaching that because you you were in you were actually without oxygen for minutes at a time. If you've ever laid next to somebody, a wife or a husband in a bed, and you're not able to sleep, or you stay up later than she or he does, all of a sudden you'll hear them go, <sighs> you know, and you'll realize that gee, they haven't been breathing, you know, for five or ten minutes. And it's like the aqualung sound, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they just came up out of the ocean, you know, and finally got back to this world and their lungs kicked in and the prana flowed again. But they were fine before that. They weren't dead or dying. They were actually blissful. And if they were breathing, their breath becomes erratic. So people started thinking about deep sleep in India. The Rishi said, that's the most interesting thing about the breathing process is deep sleep, that it goes away. And also then, by the way, what happened to me in deep sleep? I thought I knew myself. 
I didn't know myself at all. I knew my non-self. <laughs> all this time we've been very good knowers of the non-self, the unatman, and we've never known the atman, which is transcendent of breath and time and creation and all of that. See, So anyway, without going too much farther in a limited time, then connect three gunas to it, rajas, tamas, and sattva. Those are also connectable to the breath. I mean, definitely kumbhaka would be a kind of sattva, wouldn't it? And everything gone would be a kind of tamas, and everything in would be rajas, you're taking it in. Uh, so you can assign that to it. Then there is the actual uh, yogic mention of the threefold breathing process. Uh, Puraka, kumbhaka, and rechaka. And I was saying sometimes, They'll just start with the ray chakra, you know, like you should start with the out breath. You know, you don't have any air, like you never had anything. Now you're breathing in. And that's taking on wisdom. And then for a kumbhaka yogi, that's taking on of all the wisdom that's there inside of, of them. Then when it's in, you retain it. That's kumbhaka. And when it's out, you're getting rid of everything you're not, or everything that tried to get through the door when you took things in that really couldn't exist in the atmosphere of wisdom, they had to be ejected. They couldn't last like wisdom lasts, like mother intelligence lasts. Those will have to go, sorry. And some of those things will be like the lokas, the vyahiratis, the worlds, people. And they'll, they'll leave my mind and my mind will be tulya, equal. Well, there are other assignments there. The top one is Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. That's the trinity we just sang about. Um, and um, they probably go best with th their powers. Projection, sustenance, and withdrawal. Brahma is the projector. Vishnu, the sustainer. Shiva, the dissolver. And then you see the Gayatri being breathed out, you see, by the actual god, Vayu himself. And he's got this interesting timepiece on his wrist. I don't know what it was, but I called that Trikala Darshi. That's like he's, he's got all phases of time right there you know, in all worlds. Be like you having, traveling around the world and having all the languages you know, in a translator. So they speak to you and you hear it in English and you speak back to them, they hear it in German or French. So you've got this translator for all periods of time when you're a seer like that. You can, you can, like Buddha said, you can get out of the river of time and watch it go around. And then you can insert yourself into it in 550 BC and decide to become the Buddha there. So that's how facile they are knowing themselves in deep sleep and beyond the Turiya. That they, they just look at time and see it's a dream in the Trinity's mind. So it's not real. Uh, I'll be, I'll come there, I'll come there. Oh, there's <coughs> there's the Gita going, there's the, the war at Kurukshetra going on again for the umpteenth time. I'll be Veda Vyas and come back again and give the uh, Arjuna the Vedanta. So he, came, he comes back many, many times during a cycle and in the same war to teach the same souls to try and free them and they won't get free. So he has to come back and do it again. This is all repetitive all the time. It's a dream that's going on all the time. It's mass collective mental dreaming by billions and billions and trillions of souls <coughs> who think they're individuals, but who are nothing other than Brahman. And that's Maya, you see. That's the world bewitching Maya, the mind flummoxing Maya that they try and ponder from a distance. Well, <coughs> this is my first run through this chart, so um, what to do first or next? I think I'll save that for the end, and we'll take some of these bits of info from the Upanishad. Uh, I mean, we could read them, but I've taken them and put them here. The preliminary mantra practice is that this vayu, this breath of life, that's why we wanted to connect her at this time to the Shakti. So this Shakti cannot enter 
your nadis uh, when impurities are there. So not a granti karma samskara. You've got these blockages in your subtle nadis because of karmas from past lifetime that have turned into mental impressions, samskaras, due to karmas that are repeated over many lifetimes lived in ignorance. Did you get all that? <laughs> That's the, uh, the koan for next week at the retreat. It's one of the koans we'll look at. So that's how behind the eight ball we are, if you want to use easier terms that we understand. You can take this teaching right to Las Vegas. You see. <laughs> We're behind the eight ball in consciousness, way back. We're way behind, especially in the West. I mean, this is ancient knowledge. Even India is beginning to forget it. But to bring it back again uh, is easier for them because it's in their samskaras. It's, it, it's a question whether or not it's in ours or not. I mean, it's in ours if we were taught this before. And you're all here interested because you have heard it before. Now you're hearing it through the Vedanta and through Swami Vivekananda. The new dispensation of it has come back around. And then people are tired of the old superstitious religion and what, it, what it's telling us. You're a sinner and you die and all this. And what the medical profession is telling us, what the military is trying to force upon us, what politics is trying to say again and again. They're tired of that and they want this new religion of the age which is really not new at all, it's just eternal. And it, it gets uncovered. And gets covered again over the long flux of time. You see. Bring it back. So, Shakti cannot enter the Nadis if impurities are present. So first thing, let's get rid of the impurities. Five, like we did last night. Five elements, five senses. See, Worship my, my body my mind, my devotional, you know, I'll, I'll purify it all in a ritual and that will make me feel holy, see. If I don't do the ritual, in this day and age, as we were saying at the break, I don't feel holy. I feel like I'm always missing something or leaving something out. What well, was the song? I know I'm faking it, not really making it. This feeling of faking it, I still haven't shaken it. <laughs> no, I guess nobody here has heard of Simon and Garfunkel, so that's, I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> yeah, you remember. So this feeling of faking it, we can't shake it, you know, unless we f do something out here in the field of action that makes us feel authentic again. Otherwise we feel hollow, and we can pretend like we don't feel hollow, that's called egotism. Oh, I'm great. So somebody said that to Swami Vivekananda once. Well, we're, you know, we're great. We're really great. He said, "You're all idiots. That's what you are. We're so great. We're all idiots." He said, "Because we took this body. Who, in their right mind, would come into this world in this body? Is the thinking of the seers. And when they see a baby, it's not happy birthday. You see? It's like, how do I get them never to come back here again?" That's what they're thinking. Agree with it or not, that's what they're thinking because they know the disembodied state is reality and that this is all nonsense. Coming and going is all pure nonsense. Where's the time when the soul will come, when all of time is in the soul? Where's the space that the soul will come to when all of space is in the soul? Isn't that beautiful? That's Swami Vivekananda when he heard us speak that way. He said, ask backwards. See, here's the Jnana wisdom. There's no coming and going for the soul. It's in one place all the time. The mind is making it seem like we're coming and going. And that's called birth and life and death. But you're just witnessing that if you knew yourself. Like the octopus with eight limbs on the bottom of the ocean. You know, we're like Let's call it seven limbs. <laughs> we're like exploring the seven nadis, you know, the seven chakras. But we're just that one-eyed knower called an octopus 
to which all these appendages are connected to. <laughs> so the practitioner should first perform mental practice of the Bija mantra after purifying body, senses, nerves, and mind. I'm sorry, body, nerves, and mind. Sat Manu is called the practice. So this is beginning to take us deeper into pranayama. pranayama. Uh, so, understood, right? You breathe, and it opens up nadis. That's true physically. So, no, you can do that with hatha yoga. It, uh, if you get beyond just the asana, and you actually breathe, then you know, that'll open up nerves. So your muscles will function better. And, but, you know, your mind will also think better. Your senses will be clearer, too. And you can enjoy your food more. <laughs> But that's not the point. So you don't get those things sidetrack you. There's something much greater, greater coming than just wearing yogi clothes and going and singing kirtan somewhere on a bicycle and eating health food. You know, that, that's sattva. But you want pure sattva leading to enlightenment. So next, teaching out of this Upanishad, which I'm summating for you here, benefits of mantra with pranayam. That's called sagarbha, so note that. There's nigarbha and there's sagarbha. So the benefits of doing breathing exercises by connecting it to the Gayatri or to your mantra via this kind of knowledge is a hundred times more than not. It's right there in the Upanishad. A hundred times more effective is that kind of pranayama. So what is it? Pranayama attended with mental japa of the mantra. <laughs> thinking it mental you can say it out loud if you want but usually we, we sit down in the morning as, as our teachers taught us and take up the beads or on the hand and we mentally say the mantra like Om Namah Shivaya or Om, Om Mana Pemi Hum that's, that's Dalai Lama's mantra so you do this mantra you see mentally is a hundred times more powerful than agarbha pranayam. I'm sorry, I called that nigarbha, but it's agarbha pranayam, which is unattended by any japa of the mantra. So if you just see it and breathe, that's a hundred times less effective than what you could be achieving with connecting the mantra. And I would say then further, well, maybe get to it, that then connect more than just the mantra to it. Connect all triputis and all quintuplications, because everything here is built on fives. The mind, five, you know, then senses, five, elements, five. Have you ever noticed? It's called the quintuplication process. There's five kinds of prana that feed the nerves. So you could just go on lifting. There, there's five kinds of sacrifices to do. There's five kinds of beings, you know, subhumans, humans, uh, ancestors, gods, and rishis. So you've got all these f things that you need to, if you're a dharmi, if you really want dharma, then y you read those again, you study them, you take them in, you do the practice, and you retain them. We're at a stage right now where we're starting to do the practice, but we need to get that dharma bucket kind of retaining. You know, The bucket's got to be free of leaks, see? Sri Ramakrishna said, you know, some of these yogis, they do these breathing exercises. They don't have sex for years, you know, to try and retain everything up. But they don't know that their mind has leaks in it still. <laughs> he likened it to a honey jar that's made of clay. So you pour the honey in there, and you think you've got it stored. But then you look later, and the honey's seeping out the cracks in this jar. <clears throat> it's not a good thing for a spiritual practitioner to lose energy like that. You're supposed to re retain it and store it up. That's the whole purpose, not just to call yourself a renunciate or an ascetic in a cave, but to actually store something up and use it for the good of the world. If you're a householder, produce fine children. You know, if, if you're uh, a yogi or a rishi, <laughs> produce a series of Upanishads for them uh, and use that seminal energy uh, I mean that both physically and psychologically, to uh, better 
the uh, uh, the well-being of all sentient souls. To lead them to freedom would be Swami Vivekananda. It's like, forget your birthday. Let's meditate on death, he said. <laughs> happy death day, because that's really the happiest day of your life. And you get rid of this cage of bones and flesh. In the meantime, use it as a temple, Jesus said. But don't get attached to it. You've had, you've had thousands of them, and you can get thousands more. You do that. Not God, not your parents, not nature. You do that through your parents using the things of nature. <coughs> so that's what Vedanta puts all this, and yoga puts all these powers back in your, in your bucket, you see, in, in your possession. Oh, I didn't know I had all that. Yes, that's you. That's you. That's the true self. Meditate on that as Om. And God speed to you. So one Vedic pranayam then, what is it? With Om, repeat the Gayatri with the Vyaharitis in one long breath three times, focusing on the mind. So I've taken that sloka and made it into one sentence that you can uh, understand and practice. What is Puraka then? Take the Vayu from the heart deep into the lungs while holding all the lokas in mind and envisioning Kundalini rising. That's a real puraka. So if you're just saying, well, I'm about to breathe in here, did it? <laughs> How much did you leave out of the equation when you thought that way or didn't think, as the case may be? And how much more, 100 times more, will it be if you can actually do an in-breath with that in mind? Connecting the shining in a state of cessation to the shiras, the mind, with the worlds in mind and with the word that produced all the worlds before it. Om, Bur, Bhuva, and so forth, you see. And then, so what is a kumbhaka? The rechaka is the in-breath, right? I'm sorry, puraka is the in-breath. Kumbhaka, hold the body still in a breathless state, mind stilled of all thoughts. Uh, easier to do when you're practicing pranayama than when you're meditating. To get the mind free of thoughts when you're meditating, you know how hard that is, you see. Uh, and maybe even there's a way you can do it called laziness, you see. You see. Oh, I'm not thinking, I must be enlightened. <coughs> no, you're just tamasic, you see. You're just lazy right now. That's not samadhi. <laughs> like people would come to me and say, you know, oh, my mind stopped thinking. You know, there's a gap there. I said, yeah, that's called chanchala vritti. It's a gap in consciousness. You think that's samadhi? That's the void they talk about, where, where you just turned off everything. That's like deep sleep without knowing what you're doing, isn't it? If you have samadhi, you'll know it. <laughs> is it, is, is it so nondescript that the seers haven't written 108 Panishads or more on it and tried to explain to you that they felt in nirvana, or satori, or sampragyata, or samadhi, or nirvikalpa. Then the out-breath is, release the vayu back into the akasha. I mean, so, I'm just breathing out. Okay, done. Now, what went in, what got held, and what am I releasing, and where am I releasing it to? Be because otherwise the worlds have all gone away. Om's not there anymore, because I already said it. You, know, you see my point? Uh, you know, oneness is completeness. That's, you know, consciousness is, is purnyata, not shunyata. Emptiness is a stage to get to fullness. So don't listen to some Buddhist schools and other nonsense. We're not heading for shunyata as our goal, some sort of formless emptiness somewhere. Vivekananda has to Clear to us absolutely that consciousness is, it's full, and everything is, sarvosmi. There's never a time when consciousness is not. There's never a time when you're not the Atman. No matter how many 
alien thoughts or laziness or tamas you put over the equation. You cannot get rid of the presence of the renouncer. See, you can I renounce this, I renounce that, I renounce this, I renounce that. Am I free yet? See, but you can never get rid of the presence of the renouncer. That's you. So turn and look at that. And everything that you projected with the out-breath, everything you took in with the in-breath, and everything that you hold with a, in the state of Kumbhaka is that fullness that's in you. But don't leave you out of the occasion. <laughs> Account for yourself. I don't care how many people hate this, the word self. If you capitalize the S, then that's what you're after. It's called Atman. Self-realization. Then there's one of those five full teachings. You see, meditation on the five pranas. So there's a prana in the heart, and that's what the kasha you're talking about. You, know, you, you breathe in out of that. So there's, an all, there's a prana that's all pervasive, an energy that's everywhere, in which things live. Like man does not live by bread alone, does not live by oxygen alone either. Lives by prana is what Christ meant. There's a life force. In fact, when he said man does not live by bread, he did not mean he lives by God, because there's no life in God. There's eternal life in God. This life, birth, death is not there in God. Heaven is not there in God. Those are dreams you're having. They're, you're the dreamer, and you are that God yourself. So when you take all divisions away, it's just one homogeneous mass of pure conscious awareness. And that thou art. That's the plain truth of it. So this all-pervasive prana is just simulating Brahman. Just like ether simulates Brahman. It's just the best moniker or metaphor for Brahman. But Brahman is all pervasive with consciousness fully manifest. Nature is all pervasive with no consciousness in it whatsoever that she doesn't give it. Shakti, dynamism, puts all life into everything. Otherwise, everything would fall flat. Even the prana couldn't operate. You know the story. All the gods got together in the Upanishad, right? They all got together. <coughs> God of the wind, God of the eyes, God of this, God of that, goddess of this, goddess of that. They all got together and they were all arguing about who is the greatest God. You see. And Prana kept quiet. <laughs> so later on, when they'd all had their peace, you see, then he spoke up and said quietly, um, I'm sorry to disagree with all of you, but I'm the greatest God and I'll prove it. And he left. He left them all, and they all f fell flat. The eyes couldn't see anymore. The lungs couldn't breathe anymore. Nothing could happen without prana, you see. And then he came back, and they all sat up, and they saluted him. This is a story in the Upanishads about the importance of Shakti and how she controls the prana and everything. So, you know, you better inform your scientist. You better inform your politician. You better inform your businessman of the Vedanta and try and have them include consciousness in the quotient, at least start to. Because intelligence or intellect is not enough. It's, it's still violent. Intellect is still violent, isn't it? Everything it's doing is violent. So therefore, it's causing karma for us. So that not, cannot be God. God has no karma, has no birth and death, has no violence in it. We have to put this all together, so I'm too long on that, but basically that's one prana, all pervasive. <coughs> and then the next is apana. This is, a, this is a more common teaching. The lower organs, then samana, it's in the navel, udana, in the throat, vyana, all parts of the mind and body. So these are the five pranas <coughs> that you would meditate on, even in a stronger yoga, even if yeah, if you're following Hatha Yoga, you'll become aware of these five kinds of physical prana. 
And I have another chart I showed you at the last seminar online <coughs> that had the tanmatras and how these five gross pranas are working in the mind as five subtle pranas. So all of that uh, is, a, again, a part of connection. Now, about the Vyahritis, Bhur, Bhuvar, and Swar are three lokas. You know the word loka, right? You can use loka, you can use akasha. They have a little bit different connotations, but the lokas definitely are these worlds, like the Vyahritis. This is the Bhur loka. Everything physical is here. Objects are here. Bodies are also objects. Planets in space, also objects. That's up there is not the cosmos to India. That's just more of the Burloka. And it doesn't have the five elements to it up there, most likely. Three or four, you know. So you got everything right here on Earth that's essential to the Burloka. And uh, if you want to go to the cosmos, you'll have to go inward to the prana and then to the mind. And that's where you get toward the real cosmos. It, it's not a physical thing only. It, it, the mind created all that. God's mind created all that. Created the thing that created that. Projected it, that is. You see. Uh, and then there was this witness looking uh, all over it, you see, that we want to try and see. So those three lokas then, you know, they call uh, earth intermediary and ancestor loka. So that's a cycle. Well, it's called samsara. And the Buddha wanted us off it. So he pointed it out to us, you know, you're just playing into the powers of the ancestors again by uh, not freeing yourself from their influence and wanting to be born again and again. Then the father of yoga comes along and says, this desire for rebirth is a disease. This disease is keeping you bound in matter and keeping you from realizing your true self. So let's use this life to get free. Remember yesterday I said Buddhists are talking about three, three lifetimes to get free. One, to realize that you're bound. Most people won't do that. The earth is their oyster, isn't that it? Is that the saying? Am I got that right? The earth is my oyster. And the pearl in it is the body. You see. It's just all body orientation. And I want to produce more of those called offspring. And then I want to take more from them. And so pretty soon I get in this round of birth, life, and death thinking the world's real. And that's called samsara, nicely. Gave us one word to describe that. Or maya, if you want to put it in Vedic terms. <coughs> Other Vyahritis are there, I mentioned yesterday. Mahar, Janar, Tapar, and Brahmaloka are four subtler realms. If you want to align them to base of the spine, Shashumna, uh, uh, sexual organs, uh, 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 Svadhisthana, uh, navel, Manipura, Anahata, heart, Vishuddha, throat, Agya, third eye, you know, we were talking about earlier, and Sahasrara, the thousand petal lotus, that's all inner worlds, you see. All of those are inner worlds. And you want, when you go back here, we want the Kundalini to rise up them, right? So if you come into the body, the first thing you're looking for is, where is she? You see. <laughs> I don't mean my wife or my husband. I mean her the primal source of everything. Uh, but it's because I'm transmigrating away from my true self right now. I'm on a kind of questionable vacation here <laughs> from my true self. So I got to find my guide. You know, so the immediately I'll start thinking, where is she? That's why I started out chanting today. She whom the seers know and remember is called the imperishable Shakti. So they're right on to her, you see. Shakta Advaita Kali. Where did you hear that last? Huh? Last night. Last night. That's the name of our Kali. We'll put a name plaque up there. Plaque. Won't we soon? Put a name plaque up there. Shakta Advaita Kali. And so, and it'll hopefully say underneath it, 
inaugurated in the SRV Oregon Shrine at Navaratri uh, in 2021. Uh, we named her, we installed her, because she was in San Francisco at our other center, and now that center's gone. So we carried her up here by sacred vehicle. <laughs> it's called a Honda Civic, or CRV, or whatever it is. So we carried her up here very carefully. Honor, I just made a beautiful stand for her, uh, asana. Put her there last night, named her Shakti Dvaita Kali, said the mantras from the Chandi over her. And, and so there you have it, basically. We're looking for her to awaken us at all levels of our being. Uh, fully awakened and enlightened souls. And uh, then we'll go to death without ever dying. We'll burn the body like wood without ever considering <laughs> coming back to it again. We'll see like the blind. We'll hear like the deaf. All seven of these are words of power. Bur, Buvar, Swar, Mahar, Janar, Tapur, Satcha, or Brahma, Loka, are words of power. These are eternal words that if, if he speaks them. That is, the God of projection, who is Lord Brahma. He speaks them, he thinks them, you see. Because you don't speak and dream tonight, do you? You think, and people hear in your dream. And they think back at you, and you hear. I had that experience right out here when I was 19, up at the University of Portland there. A friend of mine and I <coughs> uh, could hear each other in our minds, and we had conversation in our minds together. Woke up the next day and he'd gone back to San Francisco and he said, for further information, consult God. <laughs> he left me a little card. And I was 19 years old, I was pondering how that happened, how we could talk with our minds, you know. So, but that's what happens in dream. You don't really flap your gums. I mean, maybe your body, you know, you look over and somebody's talking, they're sleeping, their lips are moving a little. Or you see a Buddhist monk, you know, saying his mantra, and he's muttering it. Oh, money, baby, oh, money, money, baby, oh, money, baby. Oh. What's that again? <laughs> so uh, these are words of power. They're spoken, that's in parens here in the Upanishad, by the Trinity. They're thought by the Trinity. At that level of consciousness where they are, which would be Brahmaloka, right? At that level of consciousness, they're thinking things and things are happening. So, if, if how is it said? Uh, well, what is there is also here, but Jesus had a way of saying that too. As above, so, so below. As above, so below, is it? Yeah, that's what we're talking about, because we don't want to think of above as physical space. That's, don't go that way. It's inward. Kings of heaven are within you. So, as within, so without. So if they're thinking words of power, and those are turning into vyahritis, worlds, lokas, akashas, and people are coming to them through the nadis and embodying in them, using bodies and through their minds, then why shouldn't it happen here in the same way? We're back to prachahar, aren't we? You know, is that you think it, it should happen? Well, it really is that way, but you're not thinking clearly. So what happens to you isn't always so nice. <laughs> Sometimes I tickle myself, sorry. You all bring such wonderful teachings out of me, thank you. Uh, I could just go on talking forever. <laughs> to turn this into a six hour class, please? Well, next week you'll have 15 hours, next weekend of class. So good luck to you all. <laughs> and, st and staying awake and sattvic. Anyway, the point comes, this is the mind of the Trinity resulting in the appearance of the worlds in space and time. They think it, and then these things happen. Uh, we should be the same is one point. But the other point is, is we want to go to Mahat. We want to meditate on the Mahat, like the father of yoga tells us we should, or upon Ishvara even better the avatar, if we want to meditate on them with our mantra, 
then why shouldn't all of this be in place to have the best view and the best communion, darshan, with our ishtam? And why shouldn't it be just like that? In fact, not just like that. <laughs> to scare all negativities away. I remember doing that a couple times at pujas and see people beside of me just jump. Everyone was like settling, and it's going to be such a nice puja. <laughs> Up out of their seats. Why did you do that? Well, it told me to. So results in the worlds in time and space, that has to come from somewhere. It's called Satkaryavada in India. Everyone from the Lord Kapila of the Samkhya system, which was the earliest philosophy in India, all the way up to the Vedanta and Swamiji, and Advaita Vedanta included, believes in Satkaryavada. There has to be a cause to the effect. And then you look for a chain of causes and effects to get back to the source, which is causeless. You'll only find the causeless in Brahman. Everything else has, you know, has a daddy. I know it's a biatch, but it's what happens. So <clears throat> if you want to get to the causeless, then you have to go through this chain of cause and effects and uh, be willing to sort through it, to pierce through it if you need to, like her weapons. You know, take on her weapons and pierce through the appearances. So that just leaves in the five minutes remaining uh, the final two things here. I wish I could spend more time on this last one, but kumbhaka pranayam is no breath at all. You're just like living in a breathless state. That's hard to understand, but here's how it's explained. Both expiration and inspiration cease. So that's out breath, in breath, but the mind also denies and affirms, right? So that's what the mind's doing when the body's lungs are doing that. The mind is also saying no, and it's also saying yes. It would be nice if it could say neti neti and iti iti, but it's not quite there yet, you see. <laughs> so when expiration and inspiration cease, one depends solely upon Brahman. So all breath happens in Brahman, if it happens at all. The giving up of all objects is then called rechaka. So your out breath is giving up everything. The taking on of spiritual knowledge is called piraka. So when you breathe in again, you take on everything that you know and that you've proved to be valid and true. The retaining of such knowledge is called kumbhaka. So what you, when you breathe out everything that wasn't, you breathe every, out in everything it is, you keep what always is. And that's called, as, as probably as, as easily as can be put in words, kumbhaka yoga or kumbhaka pranayam is only through that kumbhaka that kumbhaka can be fully mastered. So you can go on doing breathing exercises with the body and lungs alone, but until you make these connections, you'll never understand what no breath means you know, in, your, in your breathing process. Like at death. Hum. That's it. That's all she wrote. You'll have one final out breath. And it better be conscious, you see, because you won't get another in breath after that. If you get 420,000 breaths a day and 300 and 260 breaths a night times uh, 80 or 100 years of that, haven't you had enough? It's probably about time that you do take your last breath. But you can take that last breath in meditation because you take it in deep sleep every night. So what's to fear other than your attachment to a body with lungs? So part of the reason why you do breathing exercises is to master the prana, which is mastering that fear of having a body, that brooding that, oh, I took on a body at one time, I'm going to have to give it up. That's always in the background of people's minds. And the parents will say, don't think about that, it's morbid. But a Vivekananda will come along and say, you should sit every day on your pillow and die. 
You should practice that. Life is a rehearsal for death, he said. Do you have enough boldness and courage and sense to realize that and enough energy? If you don't, then breathe and get it. Well, the final quote here, which is my own consummation of everything, Prana in Vedanta Tantra and the Eight Limb Yoga is far more complex and far-reaching than that which is taught in physical yoga regimens, where asana, asana, stretching, and bodily health are the focus. The practice of pranayama, according to the seers and their darshanas, proceeds by knowing the teachings of the word, pranava, understanding the vyahritis, the power words that give rise to the world's of name and form and time and space, seven of them, invoking the Trinity, Rama, Vishnu, and Shiva, aligning the matras of the pranayama with the three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Om is spelled correctly, A-U-M, not O-M. So A is waking, U is dreaming, M is deep sleep, and then there's Turiya, fourth state beyond waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. So you connect the matras of the Om AUM, mantras, letters, with the three states of your consciousness. The three phases of time, as well as the principle of timelessness, are also connected to it. You can see how that follows, right? Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, you're in three different phases of time inside your mind. But timelessness is Turiya, see, where you get beyond the fourth. Further, and finally, the three gunas of Prakriti have an intrinsic relationship with pranayam and its three movements. So uh, that's why I put those in there, Rajas, Sattva, and Tamas. So this is how to understand the first limb of Sadanga Yoga. So after yamas and yamas were mastered, and you learned how to sit, and you wanted to know how to breathe, if your guru led you toward Vedic pranayam, tantric pranayam, and yogic pranayam, then this is what you inherit. See, this is the wisdom of the Divine Mother that is always yours, which now becomes your conscious possession. <coughs> Om Tachnayo Om Tachnayo Ravrindi Mahe Gatung yagyaya, gatung ye nupataye, daivi svastarastu naha, svastir manuse bhyaha, urdvam jagatu pesajam, sangna vastu dvipade sangchatushpate, om shanti shanti shanti. Come, let's make a conscious offering of the small self into the great self. Let's always revere this offering and let's always revere the Lord and the mother of all sacrifices. May divine blessings be upon us. May peace come to the entire human race. May healing, well-being, and prosperity then also abide among us. Oh, peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat.